Today's interview was with Charles Lemaire. I really enjoyed uh, today's interview. It ended up going quite a while because Charles has such a great story to tell. And he's a very interesting character and uh, he made me laugh quite a bit. Charles invests mostly passively in his deals and he's invested up to 50 passive deals and took 50 syndications. I think now he said he was in the mid thirties of syndications he's done. So he has a lot of experience he talks about how on some deals they had to kick out the general partnership, the pe people running the deals and how they did that. So he has a lot of good nuggets and he talks about why he likes to invest passively, why it's a good fit for him and how he's done pretty well for himself. So as always, um, subscribe to my YouTube channel, Wrestling With Real Estate and go to the WWRE -R -E podcast, easy for me to say, the WWRE -E podcast on Spotify, Podbean and iTunes. And also it's available on wrestlingwithrealestate.com. <laughs>
but I will say that having a mentor, if you can afford it, if you wish to do it, if it's not something that's against your religion, it's really a good thing but they're not cheap because they're not charities. Anyway, we have a mentor, uh, Brad Sumrock. You know, there's his advertising. We'll leave him alone from there. Anyway, we uh, met him in 2010, and uh, he has uh, now he has created a big network of people. And so it's very easy for me to meet people who are sponsoring deals, and therefore they send the deals out to the people in the network and a few others. I mean, it's not a closed network per se. And so I get to see a bunch of them come through. So it's really easy when I've got some money to, to deploy, I'll see two or three deals over about a, you know, I typically see about a deal a week when we're not doing the, the, the downturn beer virus kind of thing, but I'll see uh, the whole group did 58 deals in 2019. It was uh, for a number. And I must've seen about 65 to 70 deals come over my desk, some within the group, some outside the group. Uh, I typically deal inside the group because we, I can meet the people, shake their hands many times, talk to them a lot. We have uh, typically a big meeting every couple of months where we have a big dinner and everybody talks to each other. You can walk around shaking hands. And those people who have money, they're easily able to walk up to people who have a deal uh, or will future-wise have a deal, get to meet them because you got to do something. You got to know them before you get into the deals in the ones we do. And so it's just easy. They want to meet me and I want to meet them. Nobody's, you know, insulting anybody else. It's real easy. It's not like walking down the street, trying to find someone to invest with, or, you know, shaking people down on the street, trying to get them to invest with you. It's yeah, just yeah. super easy in that group. So it's not hard to get into deals at all. Um, well, that seems like a great fit. You know, you always hear about mentors being for people that are active, but um, the more and more I, I, I speak to people like yourself, it, it makes complete sense for you to, to be a passive and have a mentor because it's important that you know what to look for. It's the same thing really, right? Yes, and when we started, I don't recall there being any books out there. Now, I did walk into the meeting. I did get introduced to it that way. If there was a book, I didn't know about it. Mm -hmm. And I was very comfortable with the training we got about the stuff. And, and clearly the, the training you get could teach you to be a mentor or a passive. You can, you can take it either way. If you're going to uh, have the handholding from the mentor to do all the, the, the negotiations, to do the finding, the searching, and things like that, that's a higher price than just being in the group and, and being able to mingle. So I'll, you know, I will say that you can get away with being at the lower price. I will say that my mentor, I don't know if he's the first person or the only person to have done it that way. At the time, he might have been the first, uh, but he did create the concept of having a two-tier system where if you're only wanting to be a passive, you can join at a lower price, have access to all these people, do your learning. And then I tell people when they join, go to the higher one when you want to be a, 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 an active sponsor at that point, because you know, you get your money's worth better, but I'm just a little cheap too. So. <laughs> well, that's, that's really interesting. And I think it makes a lot of sense. So, you know, a lot of people might be listening to this now and that, you know, they might not be aware of, um, what a passive investor is and how, how that works. Maybe okay. you can explain experience, about your experience and why you decided to be a passive. I know you said you're lazy, but I don't, I don't buy that for a second. I don't buy it. And who might be a good fit for, to be a passive investor as well? well? To be a passive, you know, your intent is to make money on the money you have. If you're an active, you're making money on other people's money. So I'm not really making money on other people's money. I had to have some. So I worked through most of my life. I started this at age... 57. So if you're all counting on your fingers, I'm about 67 right now. Uh, but you have to have saved up enough. Typically, the deals are ballpark minimum 50,000. Uh, the some of them are higher, a few of them have been lower, or in that neighborhood. And you have to have a relationship. To, uh, typically, an SEC regulation is uh, that you must have a substantive pre existing relationship with the sponsor. Now that's the Reg D 506 B Bravo. There is a C, Charlie, but you have to be accredited. So I'm going to assume a person who's starting may not be accredited at this point. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that one. There is the person who doesn't have a lot of money. They could go down the path of finding the person who does uh, crowdfunding, and they could put less in, but I don't think the returns are quite as good. Uh, I'm not going to suggest that as the method. I didn't do it, so I may be wrong there, but you know that's not inside my, my experience. Mm -hmm. So what I'm doing is I'm finding people who have deals. They're buying apartments that are 
60, 70, 80, 100, or perhaps as much as 300. I think I'm in one deal that has 400 units. Uh, and by the way, when I talk about the number of doors there that I'm involved in, I own doorknobs. I only own that doorknob because I don't have much fun. You know, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna be a one percent, two percent. I think the highest deal I've been into, it was a small deal, and another fellow and I did it. I was a thirty-eight percent owner of that one. Um, I've been in one where I'm a ten percent, a twelve percent, but pretty much usually it's in the five percent or less owner of the deals. So you know, I'm I'm contributing a um, hundred thousand, fifty thousand, something like that. And the guy's collecting, you know, a million or two to buy the property or something in that neighborhood. So I find those people, uh, they're not easy to find, but they're not hard to find once you get into the, into the thing. If you're walking down the street asking, you're not going to find the guy. You're going to have to start going to meetups and you can find them that way. Uh, and you can do that. There are, I guess, I would also make the delineation that there are people out there that have back offices and, and they do it. Uh, and I don't really want to name names, but there's fellows out of Cincinnati, fellows out of California, fellows out of North Carolina that do this as a business. They have been doing it for quite some time. And that's good. They have the experience. That's wonderful. I will say that in my world, I can do it with, quote, the more amateur looking. A guy puts it together pretty much by himself with his mentor or two or three guys with the same mentor. And therefore, I have the experience of the mentor to rely on. And I'm not unhappy with that. Plus, they don't charge me quite so much. And by that, there's a usually they'll take an override because they're doing work. They deserve an override. I, I would never short them on that, but I like to make it as small as possible, uh, so to speak. <laughs> exactly. So you juice your returns, right? You want the highest returns possible. You bet it. And, and, and I can name a number that would scare the hooey out of you, but I, I, it's probably better we don't because it is a huge number. It was last, uh, it was four or five years ago, and we're not going to see that number because the cap rates have flattened out now, right? Now. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. you know, but it was marvelous for a while uh, back. Bought one in 14, sold it in 17, I think it was, and it was just astronomically good. Yeah, yeah. I, I think the run up in multifamily has been insane. I think yes. in a good way, you know, it's benefits a lot of people. And I think, interestingly, not to get off topic here, but I think you know, you could be a, a blind mute that could could have made money in multifamily, you know, in the last five years. If you, what, what, <laughs> what'd you say? <laughs> so I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad I'm glad you were part of that run up and, and that it worked out. I think I think as well, um, you, you kind of touched on it. I think a good fit usually is someone for for a passive investment to be a limited partner on a deal is someone who's a uh, high income earner, you know, someone, and someone who's too busy to maybe um, do that themselves. You know, it could be a doctor, a dentist, a lawyer, someone who's who's making that money, and it's better for them to be concentrating on their job, their W two job, and to invest on the side. We find in our group that a great preponderance of engineers mm. seem to fall into this group, mm -hmm. and a lot of them. It's it's hard. It, you know, I'm I'm one of the few that did not make the jump to active or the the sponsor type position. But most of them start as engineers and then they do, I mean, you make a lot of money doing this. Mm -hmm. And so they can make that jump, but they're numbers oriented. Uh, there's a few accountants in the group that have done that. Most of the time, the doctors don't go the lead route. You're right. They stay the passives. Uh, there's a, a couple of businessmen who have gotten close to retirement and they're following the same path I'm doing because they want to retire. You know, they're not go-getters anymore. Well, they were, but they're not trying to be go-getters. And I can make a fairly good return. It, it, in my opinion, beats the market most of the time. So I'm doing that. I'm not completely out of the market either. So, you know, I, I play with both feet in both tubs. But uh, the, the real estate has done better than the market in most years over the last decade or so. Mm -hmm. So I'm happy with that part of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's a good thing for persons. But you, you have to start with some. I mean, a lot of people will come. You know, again, my experience is with our group, we'll have these uh, recruitment meetings, and I tend to volunteer because I've gotten so well uh, 
many of the people who are in the group will volunteer and show up at the thing. Most of them are the leads because they want the red meat out there, the new people coming in. Yeah, I yeah. personally do it because I'm just, uh, I think it's a great model and I'm happy to talk about my stuff and I'll encourage anybody that it is not a fake. You know, you got to worry about, is this the sting where they're going to take my money? Yeah. Uh, and it's not. I mean, you can join the thing and pay your money and do nothing, just like you could go to a gym, join and do nothing, and it will not do you a bit of good. So, you know, you, the gym rule is you got to show up and you got to do something. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it's, it is it is not really fake, but you can be so scared to do anything that it goes nowhere. Or you can be, uh, you can go out and find people that are really bad at this and lose your money that way. I mean, I know of a deal it was in Atlanta. You know, I love to do the horror stories too, just to keep people, keep yeah, people of honest. Uh, anyway, this fellow got in bed with somebody in Atlanta and they got this deal. And the guy in Atlanta who was boots on the ground because the deal was there, he ultimately, who, he also owned a construction company kind of thing. And so he did all the construction on the place, except that he billed for the construction and didn't do the construction. And so the money evaporated and all these people, uh, they didn't get a lot of their money back as, as it were. So there are times where, you know, you, you, you got to know who you're getting in bed with, you know, know your lead, be very comfortable with them. Um, you know, you can go wrong. And I, I pick out my leads as carefully as I can. And I've done reasonably well at that so far. So I'm happy with my experiences there. But you, you do have to examine them and get to know them. And there's always that issue they run off to uh, Rio and uh, spend your money there. But I've never had it happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's true, right? It's, um, you bet on the jockey, not the box, right? That's what. Um, I'm sorry, I hit a button. No, no, <laughs> Go problem, ahead. no problem. Say no, again. You you, uh, you bet on the jockey, not the horse, right? So it, it's, very much so. You want you want the, the uh, uh, an average deal with a great deal sponsor can turn around and can be turned into a great deal, but you get a great deal with an average deal sponsor, and you know you could be in a lot of trouble. Almost every deal has had a few bumps in the road. I mean, they're just part of life. And so having a good deal sponsor can help you out because they can correct and fix things correctively and move back on track. You know, I, I guess listing things, you know, I like a guy who's honest. I like a guy who's uh, transparent. He talks, tells you what's going on, things like that. And not all of them do. Uh, you know, and sometimes you find out later, she can't be perfect on that. Uh, I, I like a guy who can do numbers, has a little bit of business acumen. You know, if the guy walks in and he doesn't know anything, I don't want to be in his pocket, so to speak. Mm, yeah. So there's, there's things like that, but, uh, and, and you got to pick one who's going to be responsible for what he does. Uh, I, I had one deal and, you know, I'll just outright say that the fellow had a $470,000 rehab budget and he only spent 620,000 of that. So, Ultimately, if you do the numbers real fast, you figured out what I said. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we were paying for the rehab out of our pockets for a while because he wasn't paying attention. Mm -hmm. It requires the person to pay attention to what's going on, you know, and, and so it's, it's good. And so you got to watch your numbers a little bit uh, when you do it. It is not a completely passive passive. It's good to watch what's coming out and be aware of it. But I think if you're in the stock market, it's a good idea to look at the, uh, stuff about the, the particular stocks you invest in or the particular mutual funds you invest in. So it's not a lot of different, it's just a different animal that you're, you're betting on mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with a jockey that you yeah, want. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, I'm sure a lot of people listening to this, you know, maybe are hearing it for the first time and they, they might be blown away. They're like, well, I, I can invest in real estate and not do anything. It sounds too good to be true, but, and they might be interested as well. So you talked a little bit about that, but maybe talk a little bit more in depth how, how you vet. I know you talked about certain things that you like, you know, honesty and, and you were able to look them in the eye, how they can vet a sponsor and someone that they, they're going to give their money to, you know, and what, what they should look for, not only maybe in the sponsor, but in terms of the deal and the, the whole package, I guess. Well, again, you're looking for the sponsor first. Uh, the 506B requires that you know the sponsor before the deal. Mm -hmm. So in my world, I'm going to meet a bunch of people. Not all of them are going to make my list. Uh, I met a fellow who's a banker. And mm -hmm. so I liked him. He was getting out of the, the, the lending industry. You know, at this point, I know the guy can do numbers. And so I'm happy with that. And he can, you know, pretty much work through a business plan. So I'm good with that. And he partnered up with another fellow who's sort of wizardly. And when they got a deal down in Granbury, I jumped on it. And the thing's doing just fine. Uh, on other occasions, um, 
Okay, so I'm, I'm looking for people that um, essentially they can do numbers. They, they have a, a, a desire to win. Uh, they have a desire to do well on the deal. You know, it's, it's, it's something they're trying to do. It's not their secondary focus. So you do have to worry about the guys that are doing this as their part-time job, you know, not unlike a real estate agent. You know, if they've got a real job that they're spending their 40 hours a week at and they're working with you in their off hours, they're probably not going to do as well as a real-time, full-time real estate agent. Well, you want one of these people to be somewhat more, more full-time. I have dealt with people that are not full-time and, you know, usually it's not the larger deals and, you know, I, and they're really struggling because they're trying to better their lives too. Uh, I've worked with people who are not uh, financially wealthy uh, because they, uh, they have a desire. You can see this burning desire in their eyes to get there and to work hard to do that. So, you know, I'm a little bit forgiving in a lot of ways on that kind of stuff, but then, you know, then I meet them, time passes, they start sending a deal out. I may not get into the first one. I may want to watch how that works. But I have had very good experience getting into people in, in our group. You know, again, we're, we're in this big uh, networking group, so I know who their mentor is. But I've seen many people work on their first deal, and they've done wonderfully. Uh, they don't have a tremendous ego about how they know everything, and they're willing to be, you know, talk about it, talk, uh, talk to their mentor. In our group, a lot of people discuss things with each other. You know, there's not a lot of backstabbing in the group. It's very good that way. Uh, so I'm happy with that piece of it. So they get a deal. Maybe it's 100 units, and I'm going to look for an IRR. I'm going to look for a total return. I'm going to look for a cash on cash. Uh, and then I want to look and see what their exit strategy is. Does it make a lick of sense? Uh, another fellow, and I'm in this deal, so I'm not picking on them, but they bought some, um, it's 50 townhouses over in Fort Worth. And they had two exit strategies, one of which is sell them independently, and the other is sell the whole thing as a, as a unit in the end. And I'm thinking, selling them independently, that's like nuttier than a fruitcake. You know, so I looked at the school system to see if that worked out. It, I don't think it's a place where people would want to buy because of the school system there is not wonderful enough to drive those to be a good choice for starting families um to purchase into these things because they're large enough to, to be you know parents and a kid they're really a little too large for just a couple and but they have a garage which is real unusual for the thing so they have some really interesting pieces to the thing and we can run them to families they're sitting at uh well there's 50 of them i think we have one empty that they're filling off and on so we typically have about half an empty per month and that you know it'll sit empty between people uh, as we we roll the place and it's done very well but you still have to sell it in the end. So what's the plan? Well, we'll sell the thing as a whole whole thing. Makes sense to me. And I think it'll work, but you don't know. I mean, we'll have to find out. I could be wrong. Maybe we'll sell them the other way. But I'm thinking they at least have one plan that I agree with that'll work. Um, you'll see people that'll say, I can raise the rents this much. And you go, dude, you're crazy. You know, and so you go, I don't want to be in that deal. That isn't going to work. You know, they, they're just trying to... Uh, get too much rent increase in that area. Or uh, there was one deal we were in and I thought it was so cruel. Um, we were charging people utilities and if the utilities went over a certain amount, we would charge them more. And I thought, well, that's a really good deal for them. Not. <laughs> yeah. If the utilities are less than that, we're fine because we'll keep the difference. But if it's more than that, we're going to stick you for the difference. And I, the deal worked out okay, but I just thought that, you know, we were a little bit much on that one. But I would have... Uh, I would prefer a little bit more honesty to our customers on, on some things like that. We, we tend to want to provide, you know, good, safe housing. Uh, we do B and C properties most of the time. That's our normal business model and they're typically value adds. So you buy it, improve it, you know, raise the rents. When you raise the rents, you raise the NOI, raising the NOI, take your cap rate, boom, you make a lot of money. Hold it for say three to five years. Um, so let's see the, the other things they can do that are sort of, you just got to look through their entire business plan. Does it make sense? Uh, sometimes they'll buy it in a location that doesn't make sense. Uh, and I made one mistake. The one I actually lost money on, uh, the city had reworked the streets around the property. So it was harder to get to than it used to be. And it was like, darn. And so we had a heck of a time renting the place out because we had, had less traffic than we would have had. And so, you know, I learned that, uh, 
I shouldn't have done that particular problem. There were a couple other small problems with the place that, you know, that one was 100% me. The, uh, the lead on the deal, he may or may not have made a mistake. I tend to think he did, but, you know, that's, that's life. It, it worked out. Um, let's I, see. I, I, think, I think what definitely I'm getting from, from you, and I think a lot of people can learn, is how, how educated you are. You're passive and you're not directly involved in the deal, but you're clearly very, very educated and know, knowledgeable in what, what looks like a good deal, what you want in a good deal, what, what pitfalls can be in deals, you know, and I think this is, um, could be a lesson for someone, you know, you, yes, you can just know nothing and put your money in a deal and maybe get lucky, but you need to educate yourself almost like you're going to be a lead, like you're going to be oh, yeah. running the deal so that you know exactly what to look for. You know, certain things, like you said, with, with the street, you know, that most people would say, well, that's not my fault. It was the lead's fault, but you know, to you, to you, you should have seen it, you know, and that's because yeah. you're so knowledgeable and that you, you, you think like a person running the deal. And I think that that can help well, some lots of people's success. After learning that one, I chose not to get in one that had a similar, <laughs> different but similar kind of problem over in Garland. It's, it's like, I've learned. I'm not doing that one. Right. Um, as for, I, I took the training that I did as seriously as I could. I mean, I watched their videos multiple times for several months, every night for dinner. And, you know, I, I tried to learn it. I went through all the notes. I don't sit around and calculate the underwriting on properties on a regular basis. Like a person who's got to be a lead or wants to be a lead needs to do that. A person who wants to be a passive investor, I don't feel I need to do that that often, but I need to be able to read what they did and figure out how they did it and look through it and spot problems with it when they, when they try to, they don't usually try to snow you in my group, but it's always good to watch them. Uh, I recall one fellow and it was outside the group. But, and, and if I may, he, he called me up and says, Charles, I got this deal. It's wonderful. You know, I got this really cool deal. Oh, don't take it from me. I said, I'm not taking it from you. No, I only do passive. Send it and let me look it over. And I can't remember all the pieces of it. There were 12 things that just stood out like a big red thumb. Do not do this. But the one that was hilarious to me is that they had calculated this thing with a 99-year uh, mortgage on it. And, you know, if you do something at 99 years, you're going to have pay almost no principal the whole time yeah. because it's so stretched out. And so it made the deal look so much better. They'd done a bunch of other really bad things, too. And I called the guy up and says, uh, dude, I think you need to go back to class. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you cannot believe uh, the, the, the fellow trying to sell the deal is not responsible for your mistakes. So he is not going to tell you the things that are doing wrong. You need to be able to look through those things and be able to tell what's going on and, and, you know, this does work or this does not work. And this is a really stupid assumption and this is a really good assumption. So yes, I, I feel that knowing how it works as best you can helps. And I'm not, I don't know everything. I still am learning all the time. So, and it, it, I find it fun. Um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to not pay for all the knowledge at, at a high rate. I'm hoping to you know, learn from other people's mistakes too. So, you know, in that sense, it's other people's money there. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm sure it's good to be part of that group as well, because um, when you, when you find um, people, people doing deals there, there's a lot less, um, if you're part of that group, you, you don't want to mess up and you don't want, cause you, you probably only get one chance, right? If, if you're part of that group and, and you're a lead and you do something um, illegal or unscrupulous, you know, you, you probably are not going to get much, many people wanting to invest in that. And, and that kind of helps protect. Now, you might make a genuine, honest mistake, mm -hmm. but, but if, if you're doing stuff to, to intentionally fool people, I, I doubt that you'll be around much longer. Now. There have been a few people that have been thrown out. Well, I can think of one right off. And, and essentially, he was attempting to borrow money on the property for himself personally. Mm -hmm. which is about as crooked as it's almost as crooked as you can get. Yeah. And the, uh, the KP on the deal happened to notice it, asked him about it. And ultimately, boom, he's out too. He was actually the third person that I know of that had been tossed as a lead. Uh, there was a fellow who, uh, let's see, I started in 90. So I'm sorry, I started in 10. So this thing was about uh, 2003 or four when a person was also tossed out here locally. I met the guy that did the tossing. Um, and, and I don't know if we've hit, I, I forget what we've talked about, but I also was involved in a tossing at one point on my first deal. So 
you know, there's not been a lot of tossing going on, so to speak. They're not, they're not easy to toss. Uh, but if you, if you need to toss them, they need to go. But if you don't need to toss them, they need to be kept. They, they, it's very, it's a very high mark. They have to be really bad to toss them out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So. I, I, I was interested there. You said as well that you're not opposed to working with people on, on their first deal. Um, so no. as, as long, as long as the, maybe have someone looking over their shoulder or yeah. some, and, and as well, they, they meet, you know, they have that desire, they have that hunger and, um, you know, they're genuine, they're honest, you know, you can look them in the eye and they, they don't scare you. Um, mm -hmm. Because as well, I think, um, you know, to most people, they might think, okay, you need experience and which you do, but you can have other people's experience to help you. But I think sure. you know, the, the first time deal for a lot of people, especially people who are in this for the long term, and you'll find out pretty quickly, I think, who those people are, right? Once you start talking to them, their first deal is going to be critical because you mess up on your first deal. You might not get to a second or a third deal. So you're going to make sure that that first deal, you're going to put everything into it. You're going to make, try and maybe give above average returns and you're going to make sure that all your investors are happy. Well, I, I'm never going to see, well, I, I don't think you'll ever really get above average returns per mm -hmm. se. I mean, a deal is a deal is a deal. Right. You don't go out and find multifamily at a discount. You mm -hmm. find multifamily pretty much valued at what it's valued for. The way you make it better is to, you know, operate it more efficiently. You can get it a mom and pop deal, for instance, and they're going to want a certain amount of money for it. You're going to get it to a point that it is what it's worth. Um, you know, occasionally you can steal a deal, but it's rare in, in the multifamily industry. So the real money is made by operating it so much better, bringing the value up by increasing the NOI. And then when you increase the NOI, that worked out with cap rate makes the value of the property so much more. And because it's leveraged, you can come out ahead. You know, leverage works in both directions, but clearly you want it to go one way and you push very hard to make it go that one way. Um, but uh, you said something and I can't remember what it was now, but it, anyway. Oh, the first, first time, um, first time. Oh, the first time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. One great example is there's a couple, uh, she worked as an account uh, manager person at uh, one of these stock places. I'm going to, I'm going to say, I don't remember which one. And he worked for IBM. And so they're, a, you know, they're sort of a little power couple. They knew what they were doing. They had good experiences. You know, I talked to them for a while along several times before this. And we went out, uh, our group does bus trips. We go out and we visit properties. So we're at this property that they're looking at buying. I look over the property. It looks like it's in pretty darn good shape. And I'm looking at their eyes and they're just all sparkly. And then, uh, you know, so I'm like, I want in on this deal because they're going to do well. And in fact, that has been the best return I've ever gotten over a period of time. The IRR was just outrageous on that one. So it works out fairly well most of the time. I find that new people will work harder. I, I, they would have to have a good uh, mentor for me. I would not do it if they didn't have a good mentor or, you know, well, a mentor of some sort, um, you know, be it a good friend or something, but somebody's walking them through it. And then in our group, we also have, uh, you know, sponsor to sponsor conversations quite often. So I, you know, I feel very good about that. Um, it, it just, it has been good for me to have that group. I did meet someone, uh, and I, I, you don't want to be specific enough. You could tell who it might be, but <laughs> they went through a, a presentation on how many trials and tribulations they had as they were working their way to begin this. And they were so proud of the fact they didn't have a mentor. They were just touting, I didn't use a mentor and I made it way through and I made it past this struggle and that struggle. And I'm sitting there the whole time going, geez, you should have had a mentor because they would have helped you so much and you wouldn't have had any of these problems. It would have been worth the deal. You know, so for a lead to get started, there's got to be a place for them to have a, a start. So they either got to have some really rich relatives or friends because they're not going to get money from people that are, unless they're idiots until they've got some experience. So starting out is hard unless they've got a good mentor. And then the, uh, the guy for a passive, you know, it's hard to find good leads unless you know, know something about them. I mean, there are commercial leads out there. I mentioned, you know, the different places where there are California. I know of a guy in Cincinnati and some other places and they're, they're good leads. They'll do, they'll turn you a good return, but I think I get a slightly better return. And I like helping people when they first start. Uh, there's a, a couple of guys that I'm in, in, uh, in a deal with down in Florida. 
they've done a very nice job on a couple of properties down there, you know, and every property has struggles. They got weather in Florida, stuff like that. So I'm not upset about a few things that have gone on on the things, but I've just gotten into another deal with the, those guys because you know, they're doing reasonably well. They're honest and we're taking another venture together. So I'm going to take another walk with them. And I, I do that quite often, you know, but I, uh, if you do 50, you get a lot of different people you've worked with over time. Sometimes it's the same person or sometimes it's different sets of people. Uh, I, I will say, and, and you know, this is just a fascinating thing to me. When I started, it was usually one person, one deal in the world I was in. You know, and I only know what I know. I don't know about the whole country and, and all deals, but it was one person, one deal. And now it's typically two, three, or four people band together to do a deal. And then they get a bunch of uh, investors with them. Um, do you feel more comfortable with that? Do you prefer or, do, or do you, does it depend? It doesn't matter. I don't know that it matters. You, you've got a, you've got mixed personalities. So, you know, perhaps the interactions could go wrong. Perhaps it will help out. It, it's, it, it might go both ways. It's hard to tell, mm -hmm. but you know, as long as there's enough of them, you, you do want to identify who's going to be the, uh, the um, asset manager when that's going on, who's, who's making the point and dealing with the property manager. I, I guess I should also say, we always try to buy, uh, 60 units or better because you can put people on site. Mm -hmm. And because of that, we always hire, you know, professional property management people. Uh, none of us know how to evict anybody as, as either passives or leads. None of us carry the keys to the properties around. None of us, you know, take pe take possible clients or tenants to their apartments and let them check it out. We don't do that. It, that is not what we want to do. You know, I've, I've got guys who are leads and they're out looking for deals to buy another one. And, you know, they're managing the, the prior ones they've got in that they talk to their management company probably once a week or something like that, make sure it's on track. They don't spend a lot of time on site. I do expect them to go by and visit every week or so. But, you know, it's not like they're running the property because we don't expect them to run the property. We get professionals to do that because those people know the laws. You don't want to get uh, sideways with laws over what you can and can't do with tenants. And there's a whole lot of those things. And, you know, none of us really want to learn how to work through the eviction system because, and we do evict people now and then. So, and you don't want to do that wrong. So you hire professional management people. Uh, you know, I hear about, um, I met a lady early on. Uh, I, I retired in 2000, try that again, uh, 18. <laughs> I retired in 18, mid-year. And so at that point, I looked on uh, uh, meetup.com and found a meetup and I went to it. And I met a several people there. It was very interesting. I, I was already long since involved in this other group, but I thought I'm going to, you know, open my wings out and expand my life. So I met this lady and she, she said, well, her family has a little bit of money and they want to buy 40 units. And I said, okay, which one of you wants to quit your job and run the thing? Because mm -hmm. you're yeah. buying a job at this point. Yeah. And she looked at me funny and thought, and looked at me funny and says, we didn't think of that. I said, <laughs> God bless you, you know, have fun with this. You know, there, there's a whole lot of things you can do wrong. And so people that like buy their duplexes, I'm sorry, something just okay. Boom. No, <laughs> it should come back. There we anyway, go. So uh, people that uh, do this, you know, there's a certain level of understanding. Everybody thinks I'm real smart. I don't know that I'm real smart, but I've got a fair amount of experience with the stuff now. And I don't really know all the things that I know. I can't categorize them. But to the person who's done nothing at this point, I do look, I guess, like a brilliant guy. I'm not, I promise. But essentially, I've, I've been through a bunch of things, and, and you sort of see how it works. And some things just don't seem to work as well, in my opinion, as some people think they would. Uh, there's guys that go out and buy the, the, the fourplexes and the, the duplexes and things like that. And I'm thinking, God bless you, man. You'll get the phone calls, and I don't want them. I don't want to deal with people at that level. So, um, you know. It, it is an okay thing for them, but I'm just not there. I much prefer to look like the passive investor and a fairly active passive investor, I suppose. You know, one of the other experiences I had, uh, our lead, and, and God bless him, he has passed away since now, which is the second part of that story. But uh, his wife got sick and he needed to take some time off. And so the other, this was a small property and there were uh, six of us total. So the other I guess it's seven of us total because five guys pointed to me and said, tag Charles, you're it. And I said, okay, well, we'd been having a terrible experience with this particular property. Uh, it, it was sort of special, but that's not important. But we had had uh, some roof damage. It had been fixed, but the apartments inside had not been fixed. And we didn't have any money because it had been doing really poorly up until then. 
So we had just gotten a new uh, management company. The prior management company was terrible. Uh, okay. But small units, it's hard to find a good management company. Large units, it's real easy to find them. And, and you know, so your price goes way up when you have a lower number of units. Anyway, we, we had these people. They weren't very good. Um, but we ultimately, and they're out of business, by the way. So I can say they weren't very good. Um, <laughs> so we, we, we got another lady, and she was just wonderful. And about the same time, uh, Jim's wife got sick. He took time off. So, so for six months, I ran the property. And we walked through on the first week. Uh, it was an ice storm, so it was probably the second week. And looked at the properties. We had four big units out of the 26 that were down, and they were our big ones. And I said, well, how much? She said, I don't have any money to fix them up. I said, well, how much is it going to take? And she said, well, probably around 5000 I wrote her a check. I said, go fix them. And they were rented out and almost immediately after we got them fixed. And so we went from around a 70% occupancy number up to 100% occupancy in eight weeks, six weeks, something like that. You know, so I look like a wonderfully smart person there. But you know, I don't know that I did that much. She did most of the work, but it was like, fine. And then at that point, you know, I did the dreaded cash call. You know, I went through all the numbers because we were hurting. And I said, okay, guys, we all need to pop in and put in some money to get the thing working. Well, ultimately, uh, about a year and a half after that, Jim had taken back over because it was no no trying to throw him out. It was just his wife was sick. Uh, we uh, sold it. and. Again, take this number with a grain of salt. We ended up making 45% in IRR, an annualized wow. return of 45%. It's I, uh, not a bad deal. Wow. So, uh, you know, again, cap rate helped us out. Some dude wanted that property so badly, you know, his eyes watered, and we made money. You know, it doesn't always happen, but when it does, it's great. Um, so you could have you, you could have been a deal sponsor from there. You could have been a GP from that. Could have been. <laughs> but, you know, at that point, I was still working because uh, this was, I'm going to say 16, but I could be off by a year. Okay. Um, but I still enjoyed my job. I actually feel or felt, because I'm now retired, I felt good about what I did. And uh, I like to say that I was not smart enough or nor did anybody ever offer me a Nobel Prize, but I did enjoy what I did. And so, you know, I felt like I was giving to the company and doing things that were very useful. I, I did sort of a unique kind of programming thing. I don't know that I'm all that unique, but I like to think I was. Yeah. And so I did stuff that was, was good. It made me feel good to have accomplished those things, more so than investing in apartments at that right. point, though I jump you know, hard with both feet when I do things. I like to learn both sides of it. So anyway, I was enjoying my job, and I liked my job, so I continued with that. Um, you're looking at the clock. Are we over time? No, 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 no. Sorry, my wife texts me. She's with my son, so I was worried that. Oh, okay. I to make sure. Okay. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, I have nothing but time. I was checking it. Okay. You, right. you let me know if you got it. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to be rude. I saw my wife. No, no, no. I, was I, have a, I have a nearly 11 month old son. So when she texts me, my first thing, All right. my first, first concern is obviously about that. Um, out of interest, what, what, what did you do as a job? You mentioned your job a few times. What, what was I, your I'm, a, I'm an electrical engineer. Okay. Or it's like uh, we humorously say an LE for electrical. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I was actually just an overpaid programmer for, the, oh, wait a minute, my boss may hear this. Anyway, I was an overpaid programmer for several years near the end. Uh, I worked for a CAD company, it's uh, named Cadence, but we had a proprietary programming language. And I was probably one of the guys who was a good hack at it. Um, you know, I'm not a professional programmer by any stretch of the imagination. When I went to school, they barely had computers, I'm here to tell you. Uh, so, but I always enjoyed programming. The logic made sense to me. And so I walked down that path quite a bit. But, and, and you know, your, your listeners are going to go to sleep. But if they think about an integrated circuit I worked in, uh, I would make these little bitty designs, these shapes that would go inside the integrated circuit that were transistors. And those transistors were placed by the engineers who actually put them together. I was a product of... Uh, uh, a guy who provided what they call the PDK or uh, the the parts from the 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 company, the the raw transistors that they would then graphically place and then they would be manufactured. You know, so I'm just in a graphics world, all programming, right. and so they would want things that would change and mutate and stretch and do things like that. So my job was to program them to make them easy to use and that they would make interesting changes and shapes and things like that. And I could go deeper, but you'd really, you know, your, your groups are going to go, what is he talking about? 
no, it's interesting. That's I, I didn't, I, I wouldn't have understood what an electrical engineer was anyway. So, but that's that's good. And I'm glad you enjoyed your job because I think, you know, that that probably was probably another reason why you wanted to be passive, right? A, a lot of oh, times yeah. here, the driving reason behind a lot of people wanting to be um, on the GP side of things is because they want to leave their day job, you know. And and I think. Yes. You know, that, that could be another um, something that that's a positive for someone like yourself is if you know someone wants to leave their, their day job and they're, they're driven be, because of that, I think it could, you know, it, it could be something, it could be a positive. Well, realize that work is a four letter word. Mm -hmm. So there's really some odd things about work. I enjoyed what I did, but you know, not everything about work, four letter word is good. So, uh, in the electrical engineering world that I lived in, I've been laid off several times. I was fired once. You know, it's just, it was a very, oh, the company went out of business once. So uh, it's tumultuous in some sense. And there was always the worry that you get stuck, you know, with no chair to sit down when the music stops, uh, too close to the end to find another chair, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Well, I started doing this stuff when I'm 57. And so I had another, uh, let's see, about nine years, eight years to go before I was going to quit. And I started making money about three to four years after getting into this. We started making a fair amount of money. Um, and I'm thinking, hey, if this goes south, or my real job goes south, if they pick it up and move it to India, they do, you know, anything weird, they close the department. I'm on board with, you know, I could jump over and be the GP guy. You know, it yeah. was available to me. I could do it. And so it is a wonderful thing to one's attitude when they're working that they know they've got a really good backup plan yeah, and yeah. they're making more money in their investments than they're making at the job. Yeah. I, I sent my entire check from the job in one year to pay my taxes because we just did wonderfully well. Uh, it was just outrageous. So you know, <laughs> it, it, it was a, uh, it was for fun. I enjoyed what I did. I really did. It, it, but if they'd fired me, bam, I'm over on the other side. Yeah. And I probably would have been, you know, six, eight, 10 times as wealthy now had I done that. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, money isn't everything to me. Enjoyment is something, but I make what I would call plenty. Don't tell my wife. <laughs> she, she's pretty good at spending it. <laughs> uh, she's actually much better than she was when we first got together. Let's okay. just keep it at that. You know, okay. uh, <laughs> we won't say too much in case she's listening right? but we make more now so maybe i'm i'm a little insulated <laughs> from that too <laughs> but i i think you touched on it there that you know real estate is such a powerful tool you know when yeah. i when i when it when my eyes really opened up to it you know you have so many options to start off with and so many different avenues you can be a flipper you can be a wholesaler you can you know, you can be a passive investor, you can be the general partner on a deal. There's so many things, but as long as you're willing to invest in yourself and invest yourself completely in the business and, you know, learn the skills that it takes, you can, you can absolutely give yourself financial independence. And like you said, that final financial independence, I've heard it so many times, gives people such a lift and such, um, so much more confidence. I've heard it so many times that people they got to that financial independence and when they were at work, they were a different person because they didn't have to be scared of their boss anymore. They weren't disrespectful, but they didn't have to go, yes, sir, yes, sir, blah, 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 and let their yeah. bosses walk all over them. They could stand up for themselves and they mm -hmm. found out that work was a lot more fun after that as well. Oh, yes. Uh, I, I recall a conversation where I would, I had a good friend, we would talk about money and, and life and things. I said, I can control my expenses, but I can't control or change my income, you know, so mm -hmm. I can work on one side of the equation. And, you know, you know, if, if income is, is greater than expenses, you will ultimately save some money and I could do that. And, and I did, you know, so I got, you know, we were on track to have a reasonably good, as I call it, coach retirement. My wife works for an airline. So we talk about the coach retirement, Okay. But, you know, with the real estate, we moved up to first class in our retirement, <laughs> certainly as high as, as a uh, business class, but I think we're at first class by now. Yeah. Uh, we may not have the best seat in first class, but we're doing pretty good. It's so, so good to be up there. Yes. So, I mean, <laughs> it wasn't like I was going to be broke in my retirement. But I was going to be, you know, someone who had to be at least concerned. Now I really don't have to be concerned. But you know, it's 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 fun. I do. I continue with what we're doing simply because it gives me something to do. I I enjoy it. It seems like it would be almost criminal to, you know, go find the guy who's going to bury it in the backyard for me and charge <laughs> me to do it. I mean, I, I hate the the financial guys that go. We're here to protect your money. Mm -hmm. Protect it, my 
<laughs> whatever, go make me some more. And so I continue doing this uh, for that reason. I, I, I've always had very interesting attitudes about money because, you know, they're like, oh, you've got to be, as you get older, you need to be more, more, uh, more into bonds and, and be so much more careful. No, you just make more money so that you have enough. So if something goes wrong, you, you can keep your, your pocket change to live on for a year because the downturns don't last that long. Yeah. And then you move on. It's not that big a deal. You know, That's if you're, but if you're on the edge, then you got to be that guy who, oh, I got to have the, my age minus this doing that and just be squeaking by the whole time. I took a class. It was hilarious. <laughs> you can take a class that teaches you how not to pay any taxes by putting it all in IRAs, pulling it out at the right minute, and all that. You just have to be broke enough to get away with it. And I'm thinking, yeah, I don't think I want to do that. So, I mean, there's a lot of different avenues and they're just stupid, but there are people that follow them because, oh, that's the easy way. I don't know. No, not me. Thank you. That's a fantastic perspective because like you said, I, I've always heard the closer you get to retirement, the more conservative you want to be with your um, investing strategies, right? You're going to be a lot, lot less risk averse as you get, get up there. But as you said, if you can Within reason, right? You're not going to just buy a bunch of Bitcoin and kind of forget about it and wish for the best. I don't do Bitcoin. You're right. I don't do Bitcoin. <laughs> but but if, you, if you find the right investment vehicle and you can make more money, well, that gives you that cushion there as well. So if you do lose a certain amount of it, you've created more in the first place. And, it's, and, you, and plus, you're not living to that life of, okay, can I buy this? Can I do this? Or oh, I don't, you know what I mean? That's, that's not retirement, right? That's not enjoying living your life. There's more to life than worrying about last, every last penny. And of course, yes, be smart with your money. Don't go blowing it on everything. But you don't, that's you want you want more for your money and for yourself. And I think that that's, that's a great perspective. I think that a lot of people can learn from that. Well, um, you know, I keep enough that I can live about a year and a half in a bucket somewhere at, at all times. <laughs> Where is that bucket? Still, I'm just joking. <laughs> I have it right here. Uh, <laughs> no, I mean, I keep enough cash or cash equivalents that I can do that. But I also have a lot more than that sitting in cash equivalents that I can invest in different things as I go along. I don't own a bond that I, well, I do have a financial advisor. He may have bought a bond, but I keep telling him he doesn't need bonds. It's not what I want. Bonds are not useful to me. But uh, there's a couple of reasons we have one or two of those. Um, but anyway, it's not, it's not important to me to try and protect it as much as keep it invested because even if it goes down, we went down, oh my gosh, it was terrible in, I guess, March, April, something like that. It went down, it was terrible. It's all back up. Who cares? And even, you know, if it hadn't been as, as short, then, you know, I'd still be in the same mode. I'd still be just hanging on to it and let it climb back up. I'm not a timer. There are people that are timers. I'm not that smart. I don't really believe in timers. So, you know, it, it, I'm sure there's somebody out there who's got a plan, but so far I've not met that guy who's successful all the time. You know, I do have other techniques that I would use in the market. Uh, you know, I like, I like uh, mutual funds and I will ride them like horses and pick the jockey and ride them that way. I'm not the guy who does the, uh, the ETFs or the, uh, um, can't think of the name. Anyway, the, the ones that are just sitting in the middle all the time. I like managed funds. So, but I also like managed properties. And so I go down the property route too. When I was a kid, uh, I noted that people had bond ladders. And so the little old folks would go to their uh, safety deposit box and they pull out their scissors and they clip their bonds and they take them to the thing and get their money. And that's what they'd live on for the next year. So they, they were just living on their bond ladders and occasionally they'd cash out and they'd have to reinvest it and all that stuff. I've just done the same thing, but I use apartment complexes. So we have, uh, you know, some 30, I said four, I guess it's 34 apartment complexes queued up over, uh, you know, some of them are as old. I think the oldest one we're holding right now is about six or seven years. And the newest one, we bought them last year. I haven't gotten into any this year that I can think of because it's been real slow. Mm -hmm. uh, sold one in January. Uh, one was supposed to sell. It looks like it'll sell now in July or August or maybe September. Um, last year, we sold two or three. The year before that, we sold a couple. So it's just pretty much one or two of them sells every year. As a passive, I don't get that ch choice. I have no control over when they sell them. We do get to vote. And I sometimes say we ought to hold it longer, but that's not up to me. It's up to the group as to when 
we sell it, or in some contracts, it's up to the lead himself. He'll choose when to sell it. Uh, so I don't have a lot of control. So I do have tax issues because I can't control when the income happens. You know, and I can give you a couple comments about the IRS on that one, but it's not <laughs> a big deal. You know, yeah. you still I, I have money coming in. And so um, it, it's just you depend on one or two selling every once in a while, but have a bucket of money so that if one doesn't sell for a couple of years, I'm okay still. You know, I just live on that for a while and keep that bucket replenished. Uh, today's the 27th. Somewhere around the 21st, we, uh, these fellows in Florida that I mentioned, we just bought another property. So, you know, I'm still investing in stuff. Um, and it turns out that once you do a few of these things, then you start getting hit up for other things, trailer parks, storage mm -hmm. units. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can find all manner of things to get into if you're a passive. I've been hit up for uh, doing... Uh, manufacturing buildings, you know, triple net stuff. And, you know, you really ought to learn what you're going to get into. You know, my, my forte at this point, because that's where I've, I've stayed most of the time is multifamily, but I've, I've gone off and done a couple of other things just to test them out and see what the waters are like. And, you know, they're, they're not bad. You know, I don't, I don't feel as comfortable with them, but you can get comfortable with these things. And it's just amazing. Once you get your finger into this uh, pie, deals come at you and you get to make your choice over the things. Um, it, it's not a hard life to live. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 Interesting. You said there going, going back, you said your wife works um, for an airline. What, what airline? My, my wife, my wife works. Um, she's a flight attendant for Delta. Oh, we're competitors, but she used to work for American, but she quit um, in 12. I think it was, she, she quit a while back because she was, uh, whenever they filed bankruptcy right mm -hmm. after that, she decided to retire because they were going to mess with stuff. And mm -hmm. she, she has a sugar daddy. Now I didn't have a sugar daddy, so I had to work a little longer, but, uh, you know, we, my wife isn't that lucky. I'm not at that point yet. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that she turns into my sugar mama. That's what I'm hoping for. Well, so. there you go. So I'm not sure you'll make it on an airline salary, but, uh, good luck with flight benefits yeah. though. Yeah, yeah, you know, they're, they're fantastic. We've, we've done a lot of traveling with that. We've been very lucky. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we talked a little bit beforehand, um, and you mentioned one, one horror story that you had about, and something I haven't heard. I've, I've heard the, always the possibility of having to vote out the lead or, or kick out the uh -huh. lead. Um, maybe, talk, maybe talk a little bit about that, kind of about what happened, why you needed to happen, sure. and, and then okay. how you guys did it, and maybe how, what you went when you did going forward from there, because I think that's a fascinating story. Uh, first deal I got into, and I guess I'll just do numbers. I put 150 into this particular deal, first deal, and I was also a key principal, signed the note. And so I was taking some risk on the deal, but I, w I felt very comfortable with the mentoring that I was getting. I felt very comfortable with uh, the direction and it made sense to me. Uh, I will say that handing over a check of that magnitude the first time I did it, I had to push my hand with every, every ounce of effort to get it over to the guy. So about 18 months into the deal, you know, these things last about five years, ballpark. Um, the, the mentor actually had a deal nearby. And so uh, we we're about a mile and a half apart, thereabouts. And they were running neck and neck for the first 18 months. So, you know, they were, he was doing fine, our guy. And after, let's say about the 15 month mark. And we used to do a lot of on-site meetings and all that. He forgot the paperwork for the meeting and the financials weren't there. And that was a little iffy on the whole thing. And then uh, it turned out that he had uh, changed the computer system. So we actually lost all the financials and that caused us a great deal of concern as time went on. Mm -hmm. I found out a little bit later, you know, it was a long discovery period over what actually happened. But, um, well, I guess the main thing was he had been ducking the bank. Um, so our loan was out of a company in, uh, it was a, a Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, one of the agencies, and it was being run by a company in Minnesota. Uh, they came down and he just didn't show up for their meeting because they come down and inspect the properties. Well, I didn't really know this at the time. This was somewhat mid-summerish. So on December 23rd, I get a letter from the bank said we were in default. And I thought, well, this is not a good thing. <laughs> so uh, I called him up and he said, don't worry about it. And I said, hmm, that's exactly what I think I'll do is worry about it. Because yeah. this sounds like the thing you kind of ought to worry about. 
I called the other two KPs on the deal. There were three of us total. And one of the guys was having some cancer treatment, so he was out of service. And one of the guys had moved to Boston or was working in Boston, and so he was out of the deal. So it fell to me to do the due diligence to figure out what was really going on. I called the bank the next day, and one of the humorous parts of the story was, you know, we're talking December 24th. The 5th might be a recognizable date, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Any case, so uh, I talked to the guy for about an hour, and he doesn't know who I am from Adam, and I told him, we're going to fix it. And he didn't believe me, of course, but essentially it was an interesting conversation. Um, so I, I did, and, you know, to, to spin forward a couple of weeks later, the lead on the deal said, oh, I didn't even bother to call him because nobody would be at work. And of course, I thought to myself, well, that was pretty uh, pretty not true and a few other dirty words I thought of him at that instant. In any case, one of the other fellows in the deal, um, and he actually wrote a book about this but did not mention my name. I'm still not forgiving him for that one, but I've done a bunch of deals with him. Uh, I'll mention his name, Kenny Wolf. He's a good guy. Uh, he's done. I've been in several deals with him since then. This was actually his second deal, I think, my first deal. He was not a KP and I was. So he was uh, watching things pretty closely too and we were in communications about it. So he and I formed uh, a little group together and we found all of the other uh, investors, formed our cabal, uh, had very interesting discussions with some of the investors. You know, some people just don't quite get the concept that they wanted to come together and talk about it. And I pointed out that, well, by the time we come together, you better be ready to vote because this is, you know, it, it is, you know, one shot kind of thing and you're going to lose all your money. And we actually came very close to losing the deal. Uh, we were, when I say we were in default, we were in informational default. He was not passing information back to the place. They were upset with him and things like that. Well, um, the how, three- How were distributions at the time? Sorry, not so interrupt. Oh, they had gone to zero at that point. So you guys were making no money and-, and... Yeah, But that's not, that's not as unusual as you might think. And I'll come, hit me with that question a little okay. bit. Okay. Um, anyway, so- there were just little iffy things. Now, at that point, he had gotten his second deal. Uh, it was actually his third deal, but the second one I was familiar with over in Fort Worth. And I was also invested in that one. And it was starting to act real funny too. So I was involved with those KPs over there asking them what they knew about the whole thing. And so it was, it was beginning to look sort of iffy all the way around. Well, uh, time went on. Kenny and I got all the people together. We uh, got him all to sign forms, and we shoved him out. He, of course, called us several names and told us that we were doing something illegal. Um, I'm off his Christmas list, as it were, and uh, he was out. But as he left, I said, you know, if you'll fix up the other deal, you'll save your reputation and you can move forward. Well, two weeks later, I got a call from those KPs again, and they say, Charles, you got him out of your deal. Come over here and help him get us out of our, get him out of this deal. And so we actually ended up tossing them out of both deals. Um, we ended up making a reasonable return. Uh, he, the way the things are written, he still maintained his shares of the deal, which was part of our problem. He had a larger voting block than the other people, so it was a, a problematic that way. But ultimately, we did toss him out, and Kenny, who wanted to be a deal sponsor and is actually a very active deal sponsor now, uh, wanted to get into this with both feet, so to speak. He was actually a... Uh, a CFO for a small oil company. So he had a lot of capabilities and things, and he was certainly passable in my mind. And so he took over our deal uh, in Irving, and then <clears throat> the other people called him in and interviewed with him, and he took over that deal too. And so it was, uh, it was sort of a godsend, and he ran them very, very well. And we ended up making some money. It was good, but uh, we would have made more had we not had to go through this experience. Did you find out why that, guy, why that guy was, what happened to him? He just decided he didn't want to work anymore or was he just not interested in doing the property? It was very unclear. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, there's been supposition that there was a um, mental issue, something popped up. Mm -hmm. There was a suggestion that his mother had passed away. There was, uh, he had, he had had some other family losses in the past. And so, but it was never clear what happened. It, it, it made no sense whatsoever because he was doing just fine up until a certain point. Now, we had had a uh, hail damage. I guess another lesson I learned in this thing. Uh, we'd had hail damage. We have a lot of hail in Texas. Um, the first property, just about the time, um, well, it would have been late, late summer. And this thing all happened in December. So somewhere about six months before. Well, I recall him telling me that 
this is a godsend because we'll be able to make a lot of money off that insurance company. I think what I learned from that was you really shouldn't try to cheat your insurance company because it's not a good idea. You know, expect to get what you should get, not more than what you should get would be my rule of thumb. And we ended up in court with those people for about three years before we finally got that thing settled. And, you know, so it didn't make us any money whatsoever to fight with those guys over something we shouldn't have been a fighting for. And after he got the, you know, sort of a contentious thing, they weren't happy with us at all. So we did have to actually fight for what we should have gotten, much less what we shouldn't have gotten. So there was that. Uh, so I learned to, you know, tell the bank. So that leads me into the next one. And that is that I was on that small property, uh, the one I own 38% of, the other fellow in the deal owned the 62%. It was actually the same fellow who had taken time off for his uh, wife. Nice guy, older than I am, a little bit more overweight, and uh, sadly he passed away. Mm. And I got the well, surprise. You guys owned the deal during. Oh the yeah, and he was the he was the the principal, the lead on the deal. I was a KP on that deal. You know, we needed both of our our monies to cover the deal. It was a small sixteen unit uh, class A apartment, which is not what we normally do, but it was doing well. Uh, and it, it was sort of a hobby apartment for us. You know, we, we both enjoyed it. Uh, he was having fun running it. I was having fun getting the checks from it. But, you know, I was involved in it, too. Um, anyway, I get the phone call that he'd passed away. And so, you know, we went up and, and looked at all that stuff. Well, I had learned, call the bank called the bank and I thought I just was rolling the floor after the phone call with those guys because as I explained to him that you know he had passed away they said oh well we've not had that happen before I don't know what we have to do I said well I hope you figure it out because I sure don't yeah anyway it, it does turn out that because I had become a bit more wealthy by that point I could cover our loan by myself his estate could not cover the loan because you know it's not part of the deal so luckily I was able to do that. We were able to work out, you know, small fees to get that thing changed over and set up. And so it worked out all well. I became the lead on that deal for, I guess, uh, it happened in January when he passed away. We ultimately sold it uh, in October. Uh, you know, his family would prefer money over apartments. And so it worked out real well. And we ended up uh, doing pretty good on the deal. We'd owned it for about six years at that point. And I, you know, again, number good times guy wanted a whole lot and that was great but he uh he we ended up making a 29 off the top of my head 29 percent internal rate of return so 29 percent per year kind of thing all the way up yeah i only talk in irrs because the total return doesn't make much sense because you unless you nail the period yeah so, so um, um the, the irr is you know obviously an important factor but maybe not everyone would know does, knows what an irr is it, internal rates of return obviously what it stands for well, but maybe you can give a better I, I can explain this in the saying when you go to the bank and you make a loan you can get a loan that's simple interest and that says that you borrow the money for two years at eight percent you're going to pay them eight percent for the first year and eight for the second year and you may only pay it at the end of the two years and that's fine because there's no compounding mm -hmm. irr takes compounding into effect so it's the difference between that apy and that apr when you walk down to the bank that little bitty point and it may not look like a lot when you're only making 1% on your money, you know, where they're telling you, oh, yeah, it's 1% or 1.0221 1 or something percent when you talked about the yield. But when you talk about 10, 20, 30% returns mm -hmm. and you throw that compounding into there, it gets to be huge. So if you say that I made 100% over five years, so you take, oh, 100% divided by five, it's 20%. Well, it's really not 20% because there's compounding involved. So the IRR is what takes the compounding into account and really gives you the real rate that it was it was compounded over for the full time. Mm -hmm. uh, does that work for you? Yeah, there? absolutely. Yeah, no, no. Okay. I, it's just for just for everyone. Huh? And I think it also obviously takes in the time value of money as well, right? Because well, that's, um, you that's get, compounding. Uh, yeah, you make you make yeah you make ten thousand over one year, or you make ten thousand over five years. Well, that ten thousand over one year is worth a lot more than over. So I think that's, yep. that's how I always had to explain. Um, sure. thank, you, thank you for explaining that. That's because it, it can be kind of complicated, but I think it's a very important figure because you, you, you get the, an idea of how much money you made over the life of the whole, but you, the numbers you are throwing out is, is fantastic. I think you've made some great returns. Um, you know, I, I think currently maybe the more realistic returns well, are what now, what are they advertising now? 16, when, 16 I, when I started, it was double your money in three to five years. And, eight to 
distributions. We'll mm -hmm. come back to distributions. We talked about that. Mm -hmm. uh, today, I see deals that talk about 70% total returns, mm -hmm. um, 80% occasionally. Every once in a while, I'll see something that's up in the 90s, but you know, at times you got to wonder, you know, and, and sometimes it has to do with an opportunity zone or something like that. Deeper subject, you know, it has to do with some tax nonsense on that piece. Uh, so, you know, there the cap rates, which is what sets the value of the property when you sell it and when you buy it, those are flattening out when last decade they were decreasing. And with a decreasing uh, cap rate, you make a lot of um, appreciation you can talk about two kinds of appreciation. One is just the plain appreciation that has to do with the falling cap rate. The other is when you push the NOI, you can make it more valuable, and that's called forced appreciation because uh, a property that is producing $100,000 is a lot more valuable than one that's producing $80,000. And so this cap rate is, you know, how much are you willing to pay to get that kind of income? Um, Typically, if it makes no money, nobody's willing to pay much for it. Is mm -hmm. another piece of it. Anyway, distributions. One of my stories on the distributions, uh, I'm in a property up in uh, um, Columbus, Ohio. Nice property. I think it's about 120 units off the top of my head. Well, we had two clowns in two cars on two different days during one month that slammed into our buildings and drove off. <laughs> and so... We paid for it because, you know, the damage is not so much that it's going to hit the insurance minimum. You know, you, you own a million dollar property. You don't put a de deductible on it of a hundred dollars. You know, it's just the deductible is going to be sort of up there. So by and large, you know, that distribution was a little bit short that particular quarter. My point being is whenever I talk to people about this stuff, I tell them, do not consider the distributions to be your eating money. Consider that to be your vacation money. Or after you've saved it up for a while, maybe you can use it to eat. But do not plan to eat on those distributions or you will be hungry occasionally. Mm -hmm. If the boiler goes out on some of these properties, you know, you got a $30,000 bill to pay for a new boiler, you are not going to see a dis distribution that quarter and maybe the one after that. Um, you know, there's things like that that happen all the time. It just how, doesn't. How do you feel as a, as a passive investor with something like that? How do you feel? That, is you, do you understand or do you feel that they should have um, capital reserves just in case for things like that? You know, airlines ought to have spare airplanes when things don't work. And, you know, the Navy ought to have spare ships sitting around. And heck, I ought to have spare money sitting around, which I do, in fact. But that's beside the point. You know, if, if they were to collect up enough money for every contingency, that means that they would have to have a much larger raise, which would mean a lower return. That's why we call it a risky investment. There are risks, but the rewards are usually well worth the risks. You know, you, you don't, you don't over, over purchase. You don't double subscribe the deal simply because, oh, that way we'll have spare money. You know, it doesn't work that way. You know, you, you, you operate to a reasonable amount. You don't try to cover every contingency. So I'm, I'm okay with it. You know, I, I, people, get into these things and they go like, oh, I put my 100 in and I'm expecting to get 10% return. So they ought to be paying me 2,500 next week. And I'm going like, eh, it'll probably take them a you know, couple of months or three or maybe a quarter or two to stabilize. And you won't see money until that happens. Now there are people and, and there, there are deals where they will collect extra money so that they can hand it back to you Mm -hmm. So that you can think that you got paid for that first quarter. And I'm thinking, well, golly, let me see. They're taking a cut. So what I've really done is just handed them money for not doing anything. Now, that's not real bright. So, you know, I go into it with the attitude that uh, on a, you know, we have a, a contingency uh, continuum. A yield play is one that's doing pretty good. And you're probably taking over from a really good operator. And a value play that's one that's in really bad shape. And so you're going to have to put a lot of money into it. Well, a yield play is going to take a quarter or two to stabilize because you got to get new management in place and maybe retenant the place a little bit or something like that, you know, and do a little bit of brush up around the thing. So it may take a quarter, it may take two quarters to get start getting those distributions in line. That value play, I'm in one deal that I probably won't see a check, and I know this for two years, maybe three. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but I'm I'm in a position in my life that that's not the most important thing to me. I like, you know, that that ladder of apartments. And so that thing will do wonderfully at some point. Uh, 
if I can, I'll tell you the story about one. And again, the numbers are from the past, so don't take them as a, as a grain of salt. Uh, I put 125 into a deal. It's up in Denton, Texas. And at the two-year point, he had paid me, I think, about 10000 uh, in distributions for the first two years. You know, it took a while to get started, and then he paid pretty well. Mm -hmm. Well, at the end of two years, or right at, before the end of two years, you can do a supplemental loan. So in the days when properties are going up in value, you want to pull out some of that equity, send it out to your investors, make them happy people. Well, he did that, and he sends me a check for 116000 so I'm in my mind going, I got nine in the deal, big deal. You know, 125 minus the 116, 9,000. Yeah, 9,000, no big deal. I almost thought I did the math wrong. Um, <laughs> so I'm sitting there. And so for the next four and a half years, Zippo, nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, no distributions whatsoever. You know, and there's a little bit of frustration, but the property still looks okay. It could use a little bit of there, a little bit there. So uh, we get around to the point where we're going to sell it. And I'm thinking, eh, I'm going to get maybe 150 on this deal. You know, something like that. And I would have been, well, I wouldn't say I'd be happy. I'd be just okay. I'd do the math and find out what I made. And goes, huh, that wasn't a lot. But anyway, at the end of this four and a half year, you know, nothing, he sends me a check for $340,000. And I'm like, well, I'm happy with this. You know, <laughs> I, you know darn, they didn't pay me nothing on my 9,000 for four and a half years, but I think I did okay. Yeah. You know, I'm not, you know, it, it, it works out okay. Now, again, you're in a really good market situation. The cap rates are going in the right direction and you find somebody who wants to buy that thing and they've been looking real hard. The place looks pretty good. We, uh, we changed the air conditioning systems. You know, you can have a central air conditioning system or you can have what they call splits, which are just like in your house, a unit for every apartment. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, about half the place when we started had the central part. It was built in two phases. And we went to the trouble of switching them all out. So it was a, it was a more valuable property. And, you know, they, they paid a reasonable amount or maybe more. I don't know. Uh, in any case, we made, a, we made a really good killing on the thing. And I was just perfectly happy. So in January, you know, here I am all worried. You know, am, am I not going to be able to eat this year? I get a $340,000 check. And most of that got turned around and stuck somewhere else in another property recently, too. So, eh, I'm okay. You know, I don't think I'm going to starve this year. Yeah, that's great. Uh, well, thank you for sharing those numbers and being so candid about how much money you make. No, obviously, not everyone is so... Just, so just realize that that was a wonderful time. <laughs> I expect that the last decade was great. And mm -hmm. this decade, with the exception of the beer virus, will be good. Mm -hmm. You know, I went to economic... Uh, uh, meetings regularly over the last five years and every one of those they'd say we're going to have probably a downturn and we'll have a bad year somewhere in the next five and they kept saying that somewhere in the next five well we got to it poof we're here yeah. no big surprise and so all of the deals in my humble opinion will sit and uh, they'll sort of languish for a year so what would have taken me five years will take me six mm -hmm. is that going to kill me no you know, I, it's not it's not an exact science. It's just a reasonably good investment. the The market has done reasonably well on its rebound. It'll go up. It'll go down. Big deal. The houses market, it'll go up or it'll sit still. It doesn't go down that much, as from what I've seen so far. It can, but not well. Housing multifamily doesn't go down that fast. It sort of sits still and then takes off again, perhaps. But you know, so I'm 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 reasonably happy with it. Yeah, yeah. I and um. I think with multifamily, it's like you said, the difference is single family because of that income stream and because people need the demographics behind it more, now more than ever, right? We're becoming more and more of a rented nation. You know, um, people are buying houses later in lives. They're settling down later in lives as the baby boomers are downsizing. So they, they're looking for apartments and an easy place to live rather they don't have to worry about their, all their amenities at the place. It, it's all bodes well for multifamily. So even though, you know, where are we heading? Who knows, right? Are we heading into a little bit of a stormy weather? You know, use the plane analogy again. Are we heading into some turbulence? Probably, right? But, you know, you, the, the multifamily plane is one of the best planes to be flying in, I think, right now. We'll, we'll find the airport. I'm sure of it. You know, they'll, yeah. they'll find the airport and we'll land just fine. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there is, you know, things that people should know as they get into this is the, the differences, you know, there's A, B, C, and D type properties. Mm -hmm. You know, A are the really new fancy ones with all the amenities. They don't really lend themselves to a value add kind of thing. 
-hmm. you get into them uh, typically you know it's your large companies your REITs uh, your insurance companies that will own places like that but people do too uh, and you can get into those they pay reasonably well but as we have harder times people move from the A's to the B's as we have reasonably good times in certain areas San Antonio being one of them there's mm -hmm. not a lot of difference in price between them so they'll get suckered into moving up to the A's until you know the the concessions disappear then they'll move back down to the B's so some of my B properties the ones I'm invested with, I don't own anything. I'm just the investor. When I say my properties, that's what I mean. But uh, you know, they're they're struggling would be way too strong a word. We have some vacancies in them at this point that we have seen people move up to the A's because of the, the concessions. Mm -hmm. But as time goes on, those concessions, these places get a little bit older. Mm -hmm. They'll they'll move back down into my place. As times get rough, they'll be moving out of those A's down to my B's and my B people might be moving to my C's. Nobody moves to D. D means ter terrible. Don't do that. Yeah. You know, these are the ones where the pizza guy will not deliver. We don't buy them. We <laughs> all, the police, them. all the police might not even go as well. Yeah. There are some of those. <laughs> they, uh, the police know every D of property. Uh, they, yeah. they are there. So we, you know, I don't do D, but uh, B's and C's work fairly well. You're dealing with, uh, you know, they're not rich people. Mm -hmm. but you provide them a great place to live. You, you provide them with safety. They have families. They deserve to have a, a clean place to live and a safe place to live. And we do that. And, you know, they will pay a reasonable amount for that. Mm -hmm. so. I, and I think as we're talking about investments and making money and whatnot, I think, you know, um, a lot that gets messed sometimes is that um, as, you know, apartment investors, I think we do, we provide a service that is missed sometimes. Yes, of course, we want to make money on our money, but um, just hearing you talk, I, I, I'm pretty sure the same, you're the same way as me. You want to provide people with a great place to live, you know, or as best as they, they can afford at that time. And I think there's a lot of value to that, to provide, to knowing that you're providing families and couples with a great place to live that, you know, you, you, you know, it's a nice place that they can go home to every day that's safe and that's well taken care of. I don't mind making a buck, but mm -hmm. I will say that the leads that do the best are the ones that make it a nice place to live mm -hmm. because then every person who lives there tells their relatives, Hey, this is a nice place to live. And they move in and that lowers our vacancy and we stay fairly well occupied when we're a nice place to live. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're a bad place to live, you don't do your maintenance, you're a slumlord, they try to move out. And it does do you a bit of good. Now, we still have people, you know, there are skips. There's always skips in these things. And there's people that lose their jobs. You know, right now with this COVID thing going on, uh, I have all sorts of heart for the people that have lost their jobs. I have very little sympathy for the people that are collecting and buying the big screen TVs instead of paying me. I, I, I'm not very sympathetic along that line. But for the guys that are struggling, you know, I like to work out as best we can to deal with those folks. So, you know, we're, we're doing what we can on that one. Um, it's, it, it is nice, but uh, we just did a backpack uh, drive, uh, a school drive for one of the places over in Irving. And it's really nice. I mean, the leads are just deep into that stuff and they've done that. We had one lady, she turns them into real communities. You know, everybody wants to live in that place. So we keep it full. It's just great. So, you know, it's, it's, it's good for our pockets, but it's good for the people too. Yeah. It works absolutely. out. Absolutely. I guess if I can go back to getting into these deals. Yeah, please do. Uh, when you look at the, when you look at them, I think that leads will oversell a couple of pieces. Uh, it is true that you can use your IRA money to get into one of these deals. As an IRA, I can take my hundred thousand. Now the hundred thousand is still my IRA. The IRA gets paid when the money comes out and that's fine. But there's a thing called UBIT and UDFI, which is a tax. Well, wait, there's a tax on an IRA? Yes, there is a tax. If the property that you're investing in is leveraged, you're going to pay a tax on it, and it is not going to work out to be as nice a deal as you thought it was. So don't be too excited to jump into one of these things with IRA money. There's ways around that. You've got to do some studying, and it can sometimes be solved, but you know, don't be sold that bill of goods right up front. The other one that I think that they talk about as a passive, mm -hmm is um, you can make a lot of tax benefits. And so they're gonna talk about bonus depreciation. And bonus depreciation is a wonderful thing, but as a passive, it really doesn't do you much good on your first property. 
Um, it does help when you go down the line and you sell number three and buy number six or whichever one you buy and sell the same year, then that depreciation does you a benefit it, it, and it pushes your taxes off into the future. But you know, if they're talking about, oh, we're gonna give you a huge amount of bonus depreciation, that's just the most wonderful thing since sliced bread. It is, if you're a real estate professional, it is not all that helpful if you're just a regular passive investor. And although I might be in a ton of properties, what I do does not count as real estate professional. Now in the future, I may end up being, because the most recent one is a slightly different deal. It's a, it's a joint venture that I'm into, but I'm not really a lead on the deal. But um, in general, don't get over, over anxious about the bonus depreciation if you're purely a passive, especially on your first deal. Um, and well, I just think they oversell it, so I say that. Okay, yeah, that's absolutely a thing. Thank you for sharing that because, you know, people who don't know, they don't know. And it's, you know, you can get sold and stuff that you, you might not fully understand that sound better than they are, you know, there's... There's a lot of good stuff, but there's also bad stuff that you need to be aware of, right? It's just like anything, just like anything in life. You just well, want to be go, going in with your eyes wide open. It's not a terrible piece of the puzzle. It's just that, you know, it's this big jewel they try to pass you. Mm -hmm. And it turns out to be a rhinestone okay. in the rough. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, I, I mentioned to you earlier, this, this show is called Wrestling with Real Estate. I used to be a professional wrestler. Um, so we have some wrestling themed questions that they go along with real estate. But um, I always start with the toughest one, the, the, the nitty gritty question. <laughs> what would your wrestling name be? Yeah, you mentioned this at the beginning before we started taping. And I thought about it a little bit as we went. And I'm thinking I'm going to wear a big W for the wimp because I am not <laughs> athletic. <laughs> and looking, by the way, looking at your size, I would not want to have to wrestle you. <laughs> I was, I was going to go for the experience. I think you, you, I oh, think okay, you're a big e. experience. All right. The experience. I think that. Yeah. So, yeah, so uh, has gray hair ever helped anybody in the ring just out of curiosity? Uh, right? Yeah. It's, yeah. It counts as experience, right? Okay. Like, use the, use the, the tricks and the, tr and the, and the little sneaky stuff so that you learned over the years to, to, get, All right. get, to get the win. So each each wrestler has a special move. What would your special move be in wrestling? Well, in the real estate, sorry. I, I well, okay, yeah. I'm, uh, <laughs> I would love to say grand slam or something stupid like that. <laughs> you know, it, it's just picking out the deals, making taking action. You know, mm -hmm. if you if you never do anything, you'll never get there. You know, so really think it through. And I I do like having a mentor if you if you can afford it. Now, if people don't have a lot of money I, I suggest they not right up front but if you if you're gonna do uh if you're gonna do it jump in with both feet decide you're gonna do something ahead of time you know maybe read a couple of books before you really get a mentor or something like that perhaps mm -hmm. but it it can be lucrative but if you do nothing it is absolutely unlucrative mm -hmm. there is no benefit of joining a program or even you know just hanging around if you never do anything yeah. so take action take so action. it's an action move that's yeah, it. Absolutely full, full of, uh, yeah, it's full of action. Uh, no, what's been the biggest body slam you've taken um, in your real estate investing career? Um, I guess it, it, it probably was that property with the, uh, the bad streets, because that's the only one I've ever lost a dime. And by that, you know, I'll put numbers on things. I've yeah, made yeah. bunches of money in all of them. We lost... Uh, 4,000 out of the 100,000 I put into it, 4,500. I'm down 4,500. So, oh, woe is me. It, you know, it's peanuts, but, you know, it, it now says I have to say I lost one. You know, yeah. I can't say I've never lost a penny because I have. You, so, you can't win them all, right? You can't win yeah, them all. But it took the wind out of that sale, you know? <laughs> well, I, but you mentioned you learned the lesson. So on the next year, oh, yeah. you're aware of that. So it may have saved you a lot more in the long run, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so um, I didn't mention this one to you, but this is, was there a point that you were standing on the top rope, getting ready to jump in the ring, but you were scared? What was it and how did you overcome this? In real estate, of course. Um, well, that has to be the first deal. And quite honestly, after it was explained to me and after I had, had studied it, it made sense. So, you know, I'm, I'm not an emotional person. You know, if, if they put me on a game show, 
and they showed me the car I just won, I would have just said, you know, oh, well, that's nice. Thank you. You know, I'm not the guy that's going to jump up and down and scream and holler or anything like that. It's just not going to happen. So once, once I go through the math and once I figure it out, um, there's not a huge emotion there. Now, if I've gotten jerked around and some guy ran off with my money, I might have been emotional about that on the first one. But no, I'm just not that kind of guy. You know, it, things make sense. Things don't make sense. So I do them when they do. Yeah. And I, I think um, learning and knowledge within reason, you don't want to spend all your life learning about something no. just so you can do it. But if you get the right amount of knowledge, that can give you so much more comfort with that decision because you know what you're doing and you know what to expect. Now, it may not always go as you expect, but you, you have a comfort level with that. And I think right. as you touched upon, that's, that's great. That's great. That you Learn what the underwriting looks like and then follow what the guy says it's going to do. And, you know, make sure that he, he's, you know, when people fib to you, it's evident because things just don't look right. Something smells wrong on the thing. So, you know, you work through it. If you have enough knowledge to work through the numbers on the thing, and it's not that hard to do, it, it has a smell test. You can pass on that. Absolutely. So I, I don't know that I'm good at wrestling. and I apologize for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you are for sure, for sure, for sure. And there's been some, some great answers. I think for anyone looking to get into um, – a deal passively and you know as we mentioned there's so, so it's, i'd say a certain criteria of type of person that it kind of suits best i think you've provided so much fantastic information because um again when you when you first go to look at deals and you first go to invest you don't know what you're doing right you don't know what you don't know and the, the stories that you've shared today i think are invaluable for people and that, that they can take that information and help them come to a decision. If someone is the right person for them to invest, if it's the right deal, if it's, if being a passive investor suits them and there's been so much great information today. Well, you know, jump on, you got to meet people, you get on their distribution list. They start sending you things, examine two or three before you even think about getting into one so that you see what they look like. So you get a, you get the ability to see the smell that what they're supposed to smell like. Because, I mean, if one stands out to be really, really weird, it's like, yeah, something's wrong with that one. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and do things that, that make sense to you. I, I have a friend who's doing a thing up in Cleveland, and I think it's probably going to be wonderful. But I just couldn't, couldn't get into it because I'm a suburbanite. Mm -hmm. And this thing was a very urban action. And I just, it didn't fit my mindset. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking he's going to make a ton of money, but I just couldn't do it. It just wasn't going to work for me because I couldn't get into the, the size of the units and, and you know, be in that downtown and no car and stuff like that. So, you know, you do what you think that you can live with. Yeah, absolutely. Great, great advice. Great advice. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. I think we've gone maybe an hour and a half. I don't know. It, again, it flow by. <laughs> it, I, it went by in a blink of an eye. So thank you so much for sharing our information. You're welcome. Thank you for sharing in such a fun way as well. It's, I, I think this is the most I've laughed in an interview and, uh, and uh, it's been fantastic to have you on the show and I'm lucky and I think all the, anyone who watches this video will, will learn a lot, regardless of what, what your goals are. So thank you so much for sharing your time and sharing your information with us. You're very welcome. I, I, I do this, when I worked, I had no time to do this kind of stuff. Now that I'm retired, I'm very happy to share this kind of thing. It may not be for everybody, but I never want someone to say, why didn't you tell me about this? Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. so that's sort of my, my angle on it. You know, Absolutely. it's a great way to, to make some money. Absolutely. I don't know if you, if you put this out there, is there any way that anyone could get a, get a hold of you if they wanted to ask you some questions or talk to you? Yeah. Or... I, I'll, I'll answer emails. Let's okay. Yeah, uh, if, I, if I've you got your email. email on there. That's yeah, cool. I'll, I'll shoot you. I'll put your email in part of the description. <laughs> If cool. you do contact me, tell me why you contact me, please. <laughs> <Because, laughs> you know, sometimes out of the blue, you go, oh, who the heck is this? <laughs> well, thank you so much once again. Um, it's been an right. absolute pleasure to talk to you. And hopefully we'll, uh, we'll stay in touch and we'll talk again soon. I, you're going to have to give me that tour. That, that absolutely. I have. Yeah. 100%. But hopefully I'll have my fingers crossed that we open back up. But absolutely. Bring your lovely wife as well. And. We'll, we'll, we'll open. Yeah, absolutely. Thank All you. right.